Income inequality is not a measure of poverty. To a remarkable extent, the measurements we now use that we call measures of inequality are in fact measures of wealth. We're going to go through the numbers in just a moment, but the purpose of this video is to let you know that the analysis of why people are today rioting in the streets of Chile, they're badly misguided, they're badly misleading, and I think they're mostly just motivated by an urge to offer an explanation that doesn't make any of us feel bad, doesn't make any of us in the audience feel responsible, doesn't make any of us ask ourselves any tough questions. Chile, the average hourly wage, 2010 to present, and right there in the middle of the chart, you see it jumps up when the minimum wage was increased, but then keeps on rising thereafter. The rate of unemployment, 2008 to present. Well, it's about as healthy as it gets in the year 2019. On the lower half of the screen there, you can compare unemployment in Greece, unemployment in Spain, unemployment in Italy. If the current violence in the streets were explained by the struggles of the poor, robust growth in wages, pretty healthy employment unemployment ratio, we're not going to find the cause of why people are burning and looting and rioting and looking at these charts. Oh, and there's the most impressive chart of all. GDP per capita. They don't have burning and looting in the streets of Italy. They don't have burning and looting in the streets of Greece. If you compare those two charts, the chart we're looking at for Chile is absolutely as hopeful and optimistic as you could possibly get. Poverty in Chile is a problem, but it may be as easier to point the finger at poverty or this even more vague idea of inequality, easier than it is to talk about genocide, but what it means to have a country and a culture built on genocide. The problem with Chile, compared to other countries in the region, compared to other countries we're going to look at as examples in this video, is not extreme poverty and it's not extreme inequality either. One of the terrible knock-on consequences of having a country built on genocide is that even fairly mild inequality is felt as an extreme injustice. And most of these countries that have a history of genocide, they also have terrible education systems. Education is crucial for upward social mobility and creates class conflicts of another kind. What are we looking at here? This might seem familiar to you if you've been watching the TV news lately, if you've been reading the newspaper. Thousands of people out in the streets, Chile, policemen with uh, armored vehicles that look like tanks, people throwing things at the tanks, yeah. flags, tear gas, mm -hmm. slogans. These photographs are not from the year 2019. They're not from the current riots. They're not from the current protests. They're from 2017. They're student riots protesting the conditions and prices in universities in Chile. It happened in 2017, happened in 2015, and the really large riots, as I recall, were 2011. This is an ongoing tradition of tension, fundamentally premised not on economic inequality, not on wage inequality, not on inequality in earnings, but on the fact that Chile has an education system that's too expensive, delivers too little value, and fails to provide people with forms of upward mobility that really matter, not just for themselves, but for society as a whole. In these conversations, perhaps the deeper point I want to get across in this video, inequality does not tell us what we want to know. Here we are looking at a chart of some of the countries with the lowest Gini coefficients in the world, which is to say these are countries 
that have very little inequality or they have better equality. The best in the world. In fact, here, look, here's a headline stating, Ukraine ranks as the world's most equal nation. Now, when you look at that chart, how much does Ukraine have in common with Switzerland or Iceland? How much does Ukraine have in common with Kazakhstan, Malta, Romania, Germany? These are all clustered around the same point on the chart. These all have similar GD coefficients. But inequality does not measure poverty. Ukraine may well claim to be the most equal nation in the world. It's also one of the most poverty-stricken. Here's a headline for you. Ukrainian people still rank among the world's poorest, study finds. This particular measurement of poverty, in some ways limited, in some ways flawed, measures Ukraine as being about as poor as Bangladesh, Kenya, and Nepal. Why was it that there were these uh, riots in the streets year after year, again and again, over the quality of education and the cost of education in Chile? There is, in fact, a mechanistic economic explanation. The Ministry of Finance calculated the cost of free tuition for all students at 2.1 trillion Chilean pesos, or 3.14 billion US dollars per year, an amount deemed unattainable given the level of economic growth and tax revenue at the time. Following Bachelet's election, economic growth slowed to its lowest level in years, due largely to the sudden drop in the price of copper, which is a significant source of Chilean tax revenue. There simply was not enough revenue to make good on the promise of free tuition, at least not initially. Now, it isn't just the price of copper. Eh, I did some research. It isn't just the price of copper that's the problem. Chilean copper exports are declining because they're running out of copper. They still do have copper, but it's deeper and deeper beneath the earth. The productivity of each laborer goes down and down. They have to pay people to dig more than a kilometer deep. The days of open pit copper mining near the surface are over. And yes, their economy really was dependent on copper exports. As you can see, not for such a long time, but they had a boom period for several years with all that copper money coming in. And now the boom is over. And it ended just in time to cancel the plans to finally reform their system of education in response to the most violent and memorable riots of this kind that were, as I mentioned, 2011. Faced with reconciling the high cost of free tuition and lower than expected government re revenues, the Bachelet government opted to pare the plan down and phase it in more gradually, a move that ultimately allowed her government to enact the policy starting in 2016. This version cost 518 billion Chilean pesos, or roughly 810 million US dollars, a fraction of the cost of her initial campaign pledge. The results of the education reform were not a disaster, but they were disappointing. That disappointment is what's directly fueling the protesters that are out in the streets today. If you even just look at the footage and look at the interviews with people attending the protests, most of them are university students. Most of them are young people. Some of them are high school students. Many of them will be veterans of the prior riots in 2017, eh, maybe some of the older ones, veterans of 2011. That's not ancient history. Meanwhile, also, pretty much every single responsible website you're going to consult on the problems that the electoral system in Chile is facing will discuss the divide between uh, Chileans of European ancestry and Chileans of indigenous ancestry. That's not quite the same thing as social inequality that shows up in these charts at all. There is indeed a rich and ongoing history of riots from the Mapuche Indians, from the indigenous peoples, or at least the largest group of them there. Those riots go on and on year after year. It's a very fundamental contradiction in their society, which is, in its own way, a genocidal colonial society. It's a fundamental problem that their electoral democracy cannot address, or at least so far, it has utterly failed to address. When there are similar riots in Muslim countries, 
people are very quick to talk about the religious roots of why people are rioting or why people are dissatisfied with their form of government. In Catholic countries, in Christian countries, people don't want to question their religious and cultural context for why people are rioting. Is that linked to the system of education? In my opinion, yes. Yes, it is. I think in the 21st century, the fundamental solution for countries like Canada, the United States, and Chile, countries built on genocidal colonialism, it has to start with educational reform from the ground up. So when we look at Chile's place on this chart, the array of countries uh, with different degrees of income inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient, what can we really learn from this? As mentioned, Ukraine has nothing in common with Switzerland, but they have almost exactly the same ranking here. Ukraine is a poverty-stricken country, tragically so, uh, in a never-ending war that they can't hope to win with the Russians. Absolutely tragic situation. Do you want to brag that Ukraine has some of the best income equality in the world? They're, they have more economic equality than, for example, Chile? Even though, as mentioned, Chile is really losing its one most profitable industry, the export of copper, copper mining. Do you have more optimism about the future of the economy of Chile or of the Ukraine in the next five years? I think anyone in their right mind would say Chile, including because of the charts I already showed in this video, very impressive economic numbers in the last five years, every reason to think it'll continue to be strong in the next five years. And what can we say that Chile has in common with the other countries clustered next to Chile on the chart? Chile and Israel, Chile and the United States, Chile and Mexico or Turkey. So these are all countries with similar levels of income inequality. Do you really think that the rioting on the streets in Chile can be explained by pointing to what Chile has in common with the United States Israel and Turkey. I think people reach out for these explanations because they're facile, because they're feel good, because they make us feel smart and virtuous. Um, they let us look at these riots and think that wouldn't happen to us because we live in a country with more economic quality. They let us evade the really tough questions and the current political crisis in Chile raises very difficult questions indeed that are relevant to the United States, they're relevant to Canada, they're relevant to England, the United Kingdom. These are three countries that have expensive and very low value systems of education. In the case of Canada and the United States, these are also countries that have their own profound problems with the separation of the religious and the secular sphere. They're countries that have profound problems that are rooted in Christian cultural attitudes. <laughs> They're invisible to us, but if you take a step back and look at the situation, Christianity has a lot to do with it in the same way that the politics of Lebanon right now, Islam has a lot to do with it, right? We don't want to ask ourselves those questions. And above all else, we don't want to ask the questions about genocide of indigenous people, but the real weakness of our democracies, the real weakness of our democratic institutions, the profound hypocrisy of our education system that's built on that genocidal tradition, this weak imitation of Europe being sold, you know, overpriced in a colonial country. There are really a lot of different questions for us to ask ourselves here, including the question of whether or not Bernie Sanders' reform for education, offering free tuition, would work out any better or any worse than Chile's reform in education, because they promised free tuition starting in 2016. And it's because of the failures of those reforms, the less than impressive results of those reforms, that right now, the streets of Santiago, Chile, are burning. I mean, really, people like to disrespect my crew, but the fact is that you know my name and I don't know you.